Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, very glad that you've decided to join us competing against receptions and other responsibilities uh, for this session on technology and human rights due diligence at the UN from guidance to practice. My name is Peggy Hicks. I'm the director of the thematic division at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. Um, and I'd like to very much uh, welcome all of you and thank our, our co-sponsors, the Office of the Tech Envoy in the European Union for their help um, in the session. Um, we thought it'd be good to, to reconvene around these issues. Many of you have been involved in this process for some time. Um, we are working on the human rights due diligence guidance uh, for the UN, and we're nearing the finish line is the, the phrase that I'm, I'm, I've been told to use. Scott Campbell from our office will tell us more about what that means in practice. But I do want to emphasize that while we've been working on this document, it hasn't stopped our, our partners within the UN from applying human rights due diligence on an ongoing basis and uh, as they have rolled out and, and used uh, new technologies. And you know, through that process, they're also sort of seeing some of the challenges they face in, in implementing the need to harmonize approaches across the UN system. So it's sort of reinforced our desire to move forward on, on this process. And we'll talk about that more um, as we go forward. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to give the floor to Quentin Charles Lambert from the Tech Envoy's office for some opening words. Thank you very much, Peggy. Um, yes, and thank you all for being here. Um, my job is very simple and short, just to give a couple of welcoming remarks and to frame this discussion. Um, so this human rights due diligence for di digital technology is really about the United Nations walking the talk when it comes to its own use of digital technology. Um, grounded in the roadmap for digital cooperation back in 2020, this was already uh, on the agenda for the UN as technology was coming into the UN's work. Um, and since then, the UN's been grappling with this issue internally, like many other organizations. As you can imagine, the different areas of the UN's work across the peace and security pillar, sustainable development, and of kind of human rights work itself, but also in its internal operations. So the use of digital technology in things like UN recruitment or uh, you know, recruiting UN personnel, uh, UN procur procurement, IT services, and that kind of thing. So obviously there are challenges which um, all organizations are grappling with, and this is a really good opportunity to uh, take a rights-based approach and talk, walk the talk when it comes to digital technology in the UN. So back over to you, Peggy. Great, thanks very much. We're very glad to, to partner with the office on, on this important area of work. Um, as I said, I'm now going to turn the floor to Scott Campbell, our senior human rights officer uh, with UN Human Rights who leads on this process. and. He'll give us an update on where the process currently stands. Over to you, Scott. Thank you very much, Peggy. And just a quick uh, sound check to make sure you're hearing me okay in the room. All great. Fantastic. So very pleased um, that we're that we're here today. Um, and as as Quinton, I think, you know, very rightly put, um, seeing us all moving forward at the United Nations on on walking the talk, uh, and also pleased as as Peggy mentioned to be nearing the finish line on on this process. Um, the drafting and consultation process for the guidance has been quite lengthy. Uh, it's involved multiple rounds of bilateral consultations of open forums uh, like this one, other public events. Um, and we've consulted heavily with UN entities as well as with external partners, uh, including member states, tech companies, um, and diverse members uh, among our civil society partners. Um, the process internally, uh, while it has been lengthy, I should underscore it's been very useful in giving us an opportunity uh, to engage on human rights with a large number of entities across the full UN family. And some of these entities are very familiar with human rights mainstreaming, uh, human rights due diligence. We'll hear from a couple of them today. Other entities far less familiar with human rights. So the process has really reinforced a broader mainstreaming of human rights due diligence efforts across the UN and has assisted us in, in building more understanding and aligning, aligning approaches across the system. Uh, the process externally, uh, the mandate given to us by the Secretary General to develop the guidance called specifically for consultations with external partners, uh, and in particular, those most affected by digital tech. 
And I think this has really added a lot of value to where we've landed on in terms of the content of the guidance. And I want to give a shout out to Access Now uh, for having facilitated a number of public events and consultations uh, with civil society partners. Um, just quickly on the timing, uh, a fourth draft of the guidance was circulated back in July to the Secretary General's Call to Action uh, Interagency Working Group, which is a UN body. Comments uh, were received. We've done some consultations in August and September. Uh, and we are, as, as mentioned, nearing the finish line. I just want to mention one, one note before handing it back over. As the process has evolved, um, alignment and policy coherence across the UN system has really been forefront in our, in our thinking. And this guidance on digital tech intersects with another parallel and very much related process, uh, which is a study to examine the implications of expanding the scope of the current human rights due diligence policy of the United Nations. Uh, and as many of you may be aware, this is a, a policy that's been in effect since 2011, but has a narrow focus on UN support to non-UN security forces. Um, so this study on expanding the existing policy, which was also mandated by the Secretary General's Executive Committee, uh, was begun before we began our work uh, on this non-binding guidance for our use of digital tech at the UN. Uh, and in discussion with many actors along the way throughout the process, there was broad agreement uh, that in drafting the human rights due diligence guidance, we needed to first uh, be grounded in the parameters for the broader expansion of the existing human rights due diligence policy, which is a binding policy. Uh, and that that first, that groundwork, that foundation first needed to be set. Um, we're very, and of course, the, the, the guidance that we would uh, develop, which is non-binding guidance, should of course align with that broader policy. So we were very pleased to see back in June at the Executive Committee um, agreement on the parameters of the Human Rights Due Diligence Framework Policy, agreements on the next step to draft that policy and to develop an implementation plan and to seek resources. Um, so with that set that we're now, uh, we're now have the space to move forward, on finalizing the draft guidance for tech, ironing out any remaining details, uh, and preparing for consideration of the guidance by the Secretary General's Executive Committee, uh, on which we are now trying to get on the, the calendar for that, uh, that committee's meeting. Uh, following uh, consideration by the Executive Committee, uh, and we, we trust with their endorsement, uh, the Secretary General may decide to share the guidance with the Chief Executive's Board for their consideration and potential use across the full UN system. So I'll uh, leave it that on, on the process and hand it back over to you, Peggy. Thank you. Great. Scott will stay online for, for uh, interpretation of, uh, of all of that, which, which some who are maybe not as deep in the UN system may need at some point. Uh, but before we do to, uh, move to that, I'd, I'd like to beg your indulgence for one more uh, member of our team who will give us a substantive uh, update on, on the issues that have arisen through the consultations and, and where we stand. And, on the guidance itself. So Katie Shevin, who's our senior project advisor on the project, will come in now. Over to you, Katie. Thanks very much, Peggy, and uh, everyone. It's, it's wonderful to be here with you. Um, as, as Peggy mentioned, I'm a business and human rights specialist, and I've been working with Scott and his team uh, to support the development of this guidance. Um, I thought I would very briefly just uh, offer a description of how the, the guidance has evolved through these rounds of consultation. Um, and share a few um, lessons and insights that we've gained uh, throughout the process. Um, sorry, my computer's a little slow today. So in, in terms of the process itself, as, as Scott mentioned, we've now circulated four drafts of this guidance for feedback with both UN and external stakeholders. And we've been very grateful for the time reviewers have given to this process. Um, we've received a, an enormous amount of very constructive thoughtful and um, helpful input, which has really supported us to strengthen the guidance, but also to ensure that it responds to the needs in the different contexts of UN entities. And it's also given us some insight to inform early planning to support the guidance's implementation uh, if indeed it, it goes forwards. For those who haven't been following this process, um, earlier rounds of feedback really focused in on seeking clarity about the status of the guidance. You know, is it a guidance document? Is it UN policy? Will it be mandatory? Is it there to support entities? You know, what is the guidance about? What is it trying to achieve? 
Um, we also gained some insight into the different levels of familiarity um, that UN entities have with human rights due diligence processes, which has really helped us tailor the language and the approach to the guidance, particularly for those users who are newer to working with these types of concepts. Uh, some of the earlier feedback provided um, an opportunity also for us to reflect on and to discuss with entities the appropriate scope of the guidance, what's practicable, um, what best helps us steer towards um, a, a strong uh, longer term uh, approach to managing uh, the human rights risks of digital technology use. Um, we received some requests for uh, more concrete examples to help bring the material to life and give people a sense of, of what it would actually look like to, to implement in practice. Um, and some of the UN entities actually worked with us to develop some examples that are hypothetical, but also realistic of the types of situations that they face or anticipate facing um, as the digital technology use grows. Um, we've also had some opportunities to explore how the guidance can be applied in sensitive contexts, for example, by entities involved in the provision of emergency or humanitarian support. Um, so we could tailor it to enable those entities to apply the guidance while navigating, you know, often very challenging and, and complex um, contexts and considerations. Uh, and we've also um, been able through the, the process of consultation to really explore how best to apply concepts and language around human rights due diligence that were originally developed for the private sector to UN entities, you know, recognizing that there are some differences in, in the mandate, in the purpose, in the everyday language that, that is used um, uh, across the UN family. When it comes to the most recent round of feedback, uh, we generally, generally heard uh, very strong support for the approach that, that the guidance now takes. Uh, which was encouraging, um, and also some very targeted and very helpful feedback to support us to further hone and, and strengthen it. Um, so, for example, a number of entities provided some helpful suggestions as to where we could most more closely align the guidance with other agendas that are important across the, the UN system. So, for example, more prominently highlighting where digital technology use and human rights due diligence need to be sensitive to the, the different impacts on girls, women and gender non-conforming people um, and to support an approach that is based on the principles of inclusion and intersectionality. So we've made that much more explicit. Uh, some of the reviewers also helped us to identify other relevant principles, guidance documents and, and other resources on human rights and technology that are already in use across the UN which has supported us to really promote an approach um, to the guidance that aligns with rather than duplicates um, those existing processes. The most recent round of review also offered us a chance to test some of the hypothetical examples that were now included in the guidance with other stakeholders. And we received some input on how we could further refine those to reflect issues that arise across different entities, not just the entities that helped us develop these examples and to ensure that the language that we're using resonates with users across different parts of, of the UN family. Finally, we heard that our efforts to clarify the relationship between this guidance and the process to develop a, a framework policy on human rights due diligence hadn't quite hit the mark, and we received some helpful suggestions on how we could make this clearer for readers uh, earlier in the guidance. As Scott mentioned, we're currently working on the fifth and hopefully final or near final draft. And I think it's likely to look very similar to the fourth draft for those of you who have, have seen that. Um, as I mentioned, the most recent round of feedback has really yielded input that's helped us strengthen the guidance by tweaking the language in subtle but I think important ways and to include more explicit connections to existing processes and resources. So they're not major changes. Stepping back to reflect on the process as a whole, um, it's generated some interesting learnings that are supporting us to start to think through how best uh, we might support um, UN entities to implement the guidance when finalised. Um, the consultation processes, it's not just helped us to hone the guidance, it's provided us with some time and opportunities to learn more about where different entities are at when it comes to human rights due diligence meaning that we've got a better sense of what might be needed to support capacity building in a, in a more targeted and, and hopefully helpful way going forwards. We've learned a lot about what language resonates with colleagues across the UN. Um, we've also been able to identify entities across the UN that already have significant experience working, <clears throat> excuse me, working with human rights due diligence and have 
practical approaches and insights that they could potentially share with others to support that capacity building process. Um, our engagement across the UN has also generated a lot of food for thought on what risk management for the UN looks like in a world where a proactive approach to human rights is increasingly expected. Uh, perhaps especially as we enter into an era in which increasing use of digital technology um, paves the way for a, sort of a new world of, of human rights risks, as well as potential human rights benefits. Um, we're very mindful that expectations, not just of business, but also of other organizations, including UN entities, um, when it comes to managing human rights risks and issues are, are becoming stronger and are also becoming increasingly connected to discussions about how to address environmental issues, including the, the climate and biodiversity crises. Related to that, the, the process overall has provided a great opportunity to reflect ourselves and with both UN and external stakeholders who've been involved in the various rounds of consultation on the similarities and differences between UN entities and business enterprises when it comes to implementing human rights due diligence for digital technology use. We went into this process, I think it's fair to say, with a general sense that it made sense to leverage and build on standards such as the UN guiding principles for business and human rights, which were developed for business, and we've been able to start the work of initiating conversation with those involved in the consultations on the nuances of adapting um, that approach. I might leave my comments there, um, though like Scott, I will stay on the line in case there are any questions uh, later. Great, thanks very much, Katie, for that, for that overview. Um, we're going to turn now to a discussion that looks at um, the practical realities and challenges of applying human rights due diligence uh, for the use of technology within the UN system. Um, as noted, while the work on the due diligence guidance has been underway, uh, a number of UN entities have already dived into the space, and we're going to hear from two of them uh, right now, UNHCR and the World Bank, to share some of their experience. So for this section, we're very fortunate to have with us David Satola, the Office of the Legal Counsel at the World Bank Legal Vice Presidency. Um, and I do need to note that David is joining us at an absurdly early hour in Washington, D.C., so thank you so much for being here, David. And from UNHCR, uh, Nicholas Oakshot, uh, Senior Policy Officer for Digital Protection at UNHCR, who we've worked closely with in the course of our work on the Human Rights Due Diligence Guidance, and he helped us organize, or organized himself, a workshop on applying HRDD to uh, UNHCR's use of technology and complex field settings, and he's been spearheading those efforts across UNHCR. So I'm gonna ask uh, the, those two panelists a couple of questions uh, to give us a sense of, of how this looks in practice. Uh, turning to you, Nick, first, um, since UNHCR has been a real leader in applying human rights due diligence and its use of digital technology, um, we've really appreciated your collaboration. Could you please uh, give us a sense of how you're applying human rights due diligence uh, and particularly in complex settings like those that UNHCR engage in, um, including the systems and mechanisms that are in place and how they're being strengthened. Thanks. Thanks, Peggy. I mean, as you'd expect, UNHCR has a, a wide range of policies and guidance that can help to manage risks in its use of digital technology. They range from privacy and data protection through to procurement, partnership, due diligence and beyond. However, in terms of a formal policy framework on human rights due diligence, that's less developed and you know, very much in line with what Scott was saying earlier on. But in our digital transformation strategy, which runs from 2022 to 2026, we've set the goal that UNHCR's own use of digital tech will align with international human rights and ethical standards. And uh, in line with what was said earlier on about um, walking the talk, but these standards will also be promoted with states and the private sector with a focus on high risk technologies, uses and contexts. So our process of engagement with the guidance development has very much been around building UNHCR's understanding and capacity to apply human rights diligence approaches to its use of digital technologies in order to meet this, this overall strategic objective. As uh, you mentioned earlier on, uh, in January, uh, we brought together a multifunctional team to implement a simulation of the third draft of the guidance, looking at field-based case studies. Uh, this approach allowed us to uh, engage with experts on human rights due diligence from within the UN mm -hmm. system, but also to receive advice from an international law firm, DLA Piper, which has expertise in advising the private sector on these issues. 
and this this was uh, facilitated through a strategic partnership that we have with DLA, which gave us access to this advice on a pro bono basis, which has always helped. Um, by looking at the case studies, we were able to identify more clearly the potential implementation challenges, but also where the guidance added value to our existing uh, policies and processes. Uh, the second case study, um, which looked at the innovative use of social media platforms to deliver protection information to people on the move, you know, such as avoiding how they could avoid risks of exploitation and trafficking in online ads related to accommodation or work. Um, that was particularly positive and resulted in immediate follow-up. We've had a, a regional bureau uh, bring together another multifunctional team to undertake a full risk assessment of this approach, and uh, that in, uh, resulted in some quite important uh, adjustments and a decision to develop some uh, more established guidance uh, on this innovation. Um, we've also got, uh, I think, a reasonably clear and positive uh, uh, identification of the way forward. First of all, to meet an uh, immediate priority, we'll consider the, the guidance, even though it's still a draft, as part of a multifaceted assessment of UNHCR's developing approaches to the use of artificial intelligence, including generative AI. Um, this will include the application of UNHCR's new and expanded general policy on data protection and privacy, as well as the principles on the ethical use of AI in the UN system, which were adopted in September next year, uh, last year, sorry. And secondly, um, we're going to review our uh, set of existing policies and guidance to see how we can best implement the guidance once it's adopted. This will also include exploring whether a uh, user-friendly digital tool could help the field and other internal stakeholders in implementation, as well as how best to engage with affected communities and civil society, which is an important but challenging part of the guidance. So UNH journey, UNHCR's journey down this road has begun, and I think a, a quite clear and, uh, and a useful way forward has been identified. Back to you, Peggy. Great, thanks very much, Nick. It's it's really clear that uh, that you've gotten a head start on a lot of this, and then the rest of us in the UN system will really be able to draw on some of those uh, good practices that that you've been working on. Um, I'm going to turn to David now and and ask you for a perspective from the World Bank. I, in my experience, it's not always that easy to talk about human rights in a in a World Bank bank setting. So I'm I'm a bit curious to hear how it's been for for those of you within the bank that are working in the area of human rights due diligence. Um, and maybe if you could say a, a bit about whether you faced any pushback and how you've addressed it. Sure. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Just a quick sound check. Can you hear me okay in the room? It's great, David. Thank great. you. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, thank you all for uh, inviting me here. Uh, despite the early hour, I'm delighted to, to be here virtually with you um, and for including me in the panel. I'm sorry not to be in Kyoto in person. Um, before I get on to some of the specific challenges, um, I, I do want to take just a, a minute and, and applaud the effort that you all are doing in trying to synthesize these, uh, these disparate evolving uh, threads. I mean, I think we've, in the past few years, all of us have taken on uh, to different approaches to human rights and technology, whether it be in cybersecurity and more recently with artificial intelligence. Um, I think the synthetic approach that that you all are are doing here to have a a a, a, a broad uh, approach to human rights due diligence uh, is really to be applauded. Um, I also think that, and I, I, you know, Katie and others and Scott have mentioned this before, but the, there are some elements of the process that you're going through that I think are extremely important and that will resonate with. Uh, those who have uh, history with the Internet Governance Forum. One is the, the consultation process that's, that you've undertaken. A multi-stakeholder consultation process will only reinforce the, the, the strength of, of this guidance. Um, I can't underscore enough the issues of capacity building that are mentioned in the document itself. Uh, that's extremely important for us as we are providing financing in, in these areas uh, for different digital development activities. Um, I'm also struck with the, uh, by the sort of principles-based approach. And I think this re is a reflection of the, one of the main challenges, and it's not just for us, but it's for all institutions who are working in trying to in, in, uh, involve 
human rights due diligence is um, that it, it, it's, it's difficult to have a one size fits all approach. But if you do it on the principles basis, then that I think is reflected in the document, I think that then that can be achieved. Um, I'd like to echo what, what Nick said as well, that you know, in, the, in the past few years, our organization like UNHCR and others has, has attacked different things in different ways from procurement to human resources to other things. And, and now this is, this is an opportunity for us to kind of, again, bring those threads together. So the first challenge I, I think is that, and, and this is I think exactly what you're trying to do in this document, is to recognize that there are standards out there that they are evolving in different ways, but uh, this is, a, I think, a first attempt to, to try and synthesize that. So I, that, that in itself is a big challenge. The, the biggest challenge for the World Bank in this area is that the way that we do business, uh, the way that our operations are conducted is, is, I think, fundamentally different than most other UN organizations. So, and I, I don't need to speak for UNHCR or, or any of the others, but correct me if I'm mischaracterizing how you do business. Um, when UNHCR does an operational activity, UNHCR is in the field its staff are, are doing the work. Whereas in the World Bank context, when we do operational work in the field, we're we are generally providing financing to our member states to undertake a project. That's called a recipient executed, what we refer to as a recipient executed activity. So we're, we're one step removed from the kind of uh, direct interaction that most of our other uh, UN family organizations are, are doing. And that, that is a, a principal difference. So one of the challenges that we are facing is that our member states are confronted with um, the, the kind of uh, lack of clarity or lack of synthesis in, in a set of rules to apply. So even if we have a, a, a guidance for the UN family, it's not necessarily going to translate directly to how our member states um, might undertake uh, their own due diligence. And with our renewed emphasis on uh, digital as a, as a principal way of doing business and development, I think this, this will be uh, increasingly uh, a challenge for us. Um, I, think I'll, I think I'll leave it at, at that uh, for now, but I uh, appreciate the, the opportunity and look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Sorry, microphone. Yes, good. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I was just saying that David's comments about the the downstream effects and the engagement, uh, the indirect way that that some of the the guidance would need to apply, given the nature of the the way the World Bank works in in different settings, is is really interesting when you look at how it fits with the the uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights framework. So we'll probably come back to that. Um, but I'll flip back to Nick now and just ask a bit from your side um, about pushback um, in terms of, of human rights due diligence. I know we hear a lot of comments from, from those that are engaged about um, some of the challenges they face uh, within their institutions, and it'd be great to hear a bit from your side about, about wh how you, what sort of things have come up and, and how you've been able to address them. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, I think that um, part of the process of engaging closely with the, the team uh, at UN Human Rights has been really helpful in, in helping us to address uh, and think through what the, the potential pushbacks. Um, it's important to recognize that UNHCR, as, as David uh, was saying, is a field-focused organization. And the protection of the forcibly displaced and stateless is a key part perhaps the key part of its institutional DNA. It's integral both to the agency's mandate, but also to its identity. So in this context, new processes uh, can, could be seen as unnecessary steps to potentially getting in the way of the immediate delivery of protection and humanitarian assistance in challenging emergency contexts. Uh, something which is a duplication rather than uh, a, a, an add-on. Um, 
However, as the guidance has strengthened from draft to draft, um, it's been seen as being increasingly implementable at the field level. And the value add has become clearer, uh, particularly in relation to existing risk management processes. And I'd flag up that uh, in many ways uh, over the years, we, we focused on similar questions, but through the lens of privacy and data protection, rather than through a, a, a broader human rights due diligence perspective, which I think uh, has obvious uh, pluses in some contexts, but in other contexts is perhaps uh, too narrow in scope. Um, so overall, I'd say that um, UNHCR sees the guidance as an opportunity to realize the key digital protection strategic goal that I flagged up earlier on and provides us through experience with uh, a stronger basis for increased engagements with states and the private sector, including technologies on promoting uh, the protection and forcibly of the forcibly displaced and stateless in digital contexts. I think that there, uh, there are enormous advantages from applying the, the guidance, even in its draft form, uh, uh, to existing field contexts, because it means that we're more relevant in our approaches and the advice that we can provide to, to states in the private sector. Back to you, Peggy. Great, thanks very much, Nick. Um, and uh, I'm quickly gonna turn back to David just to, to check in with you to see if you wanted to, to add on to your comments. I, I found your your notes about the, the principle-based approach as, as being very interesting. And in particular, I know that, especially given the amount of time that we spent on this human rights due diligence guidance, one of our hopes is that it will be a document that, that does have application beyond uh, the UN system as well. And, and obviously when you're looking at recipient countries and, and how they engage, perhaps um, that's one of the ways in which we could see that happen. But I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on that point, David. Yeah, thanks, Peggy. Um, and I, just following up on that uh, very point, um, and I think that the principles-based approach will enable this. One, I think one does need to recognize that there are our, our members and our member states are, are the same as, as your member states. Um, they have, they're, they're at different levels of development. And so one could call it a maturity uh, levels. There are some big middle income countries who borrow from the World Bank who are gonna be more sophisticated, have higher capacity to deal with some of these issues. And you know, if you take a big middle income country versus say a small island country with a smaller population, uh, less development, maybe even um, you know lower income levels, it's going it, it's hard to impose the same model on both. And so I think that the the, the fact that it is a principles based approach allows for uh, recognition of those different levels of maturity to to deal with the thing. I'm not suggesting at all uh, a a subjective approach to human rights or you know a relative approach to human rights. No, I, I think it's the due diligence part and the capacity uh, to integrate how one approaches technology and, and technology issues that would need to be uh, uh, recognized in, in those contexts. And I think that the, um, <clears throat> we, we find this in, in our, our normal lending operations as well. There are some things that are universal that, that apply across the board. We expect our, our borrowers to observe the same kind of procurement principles and things like that. Um, so likewise, I, I think we can we can hope to achieve uh, a universal approach to human rights due diligence. But in the process, I think you do need to recognize that uh, different countries have different levels of development and economic maturity, and that would need to be taken into account. Over. Great. Thanks very much, uh, David. I think I think we'll leave it uh, with uh, Nick and and, and David on, at that point. And and uh, Marwa has been very patient. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Marwa uh, Fatafta uh, from Access Now with us. Uh, Access Now has been involved, as Scott noted, uh, along this process. And uh, we'd really like to to hear from you. Um, you know, Access Now's views on on how the UN's doing in this area. Um, why, why do you think this is, uh, uh, this guidance could be important and, you know, what, what you'd like to see as, as we go forward? Thank you very much, Peggy. Okay, this works. Um, I'm very happy to be here and, uh, I hope, uh, our colleagues who follow us online can hear me clearly. Um, 
we i mean as a starting point i think this is a very important step that uh, the U that OHCHR has taken over um and to ensure that human rights due diligence is mainstreamed across all un entities and we think it's a step that is frankly a bit overdue um where we've seen the rollout of technologies or the deployment of technologies on a mass scale uh, without sufficient uh, assessment of potential negative human rights risks, which some, some of them have materialized. And I think that's important, especially in contexts where um, there are not necessarily um, strong rule of law or a human um, strong human rights records in countries where vulnerable communities, um, individuals and communities who may be impacted by the use of digital technologies uh, by UN agencies can have access to effective remedy. So I think it's a it's a very important step and I really look forward to um, seeing it, it see, see the implementation of it uh, and the final draft as well. Um, we are, of course, we have been engaging on business and human rights um, on a number of fronts, especially with the private sector and, of course, engaging with human rights due diligence has given us a number of lessons learned that I would like to share and I think is important for this conversation. Um, the first one of which is uh, we've seen in the guide um, that the aim of this guide is basically to build the capacity of different UN agencies um, in headquarters and field offices to be able to conduct human rights impact assessments and use this uh, guide. Um, however, we think that it's very important to add an element of independent assessment. Um, this is important for a number of reasons, the first of which is uh, oversight and accountability. When those assessments are made internally, and especially when they're not published or the findings of those are not published, it becomes hard for civil society to scrutinize the decision made. Um, we've had situations, and especially with the private sector, where um, there is a decision to expand in a certain market or use a specific technology where we see clearly in red letters that this technology will lead to negative human rights impact. Um, however, we're told that it's fine, you can relax because we've done our due diligence, we've done our human rights impact assessments, and you can trust us that we'll take care of this matter. Therefore, I think independent assessments are very important. Um, it's also... And truth be said, I mean, we're all subject to bias and um, having an independent third party that can assess um, the, the rollout of technologies or specific programs that rely on tech or digital solutions, especially when they are already being implemented is key. Um, in order to avoid a you know, situation where the, 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 the technology is being used and there is a there is an assessment, uh, but having someone from the outside that conduct this is, is important. Um, the second point, and it ties to the first one, and I've already alluded to it, and that is transparency. Um, transparency on the process, on the practice, uh, engagement with civil society that allows affected communities to evaluate from their own perspective um, the extent which these decisions taken by the agency are actually serving their needs and protecting their rights. Um, and, you know, this transparency for us is not an option, which I think the guide suggests. Uh, we think it's important um, and key for the success of this uh, tool. Um, the third point is around enforcement. And, um, I mean, human rights due diligence tools are as good as their enforcement. And... Again, from experience engaging with the private sector and also with some UN agencies, uh, including UNHCHR, um, we have seen that those tools, whereas you know they are explicitly written or sometimes mandated by internal policy handbooks or uh, internal policies, they are not necessarily implemented, and that's. Um, it's especially so in challenging situations such as in humanitarian contexts where UN agencies have to rush to get refugees registered or to get people across the border and we, we are at the end of the day operating in an in a ecosystem where private companies are also aggressively selling solutions to, um, to solve very complex problems and uh, here we see that again in such situations, there the technology is used the, um, or rolled out and the assessments are either not made or made later. Um, 
And when they are made later or not made at all, we have a situation where uh, these technologies are implemented on a mass scale. So we have a kind of a de facto situation, such as the biometric registration of refugees uh, conducted by um, the UN Refugee Agency. And uh, when you have millions of people already registered with their biometric information, which is extremely sensitive personal data, um, being used and processed, it of course exposes um, individuals and vulnerable communities to a number of risks, but it becomes hard to challenge these uh, systems when it's already been out. Uh, and then the question for us as civil society is, how can we work with UN agencies to mitigate these risks when, you know, the more you c data you collect, the harder it becomes to uh, protect them. So that's just one example for um, when there is no human rights due diligence done, um, what's, the, what's the, you know, the long-term cost of that. And one point also to raise here, and I think um, David mentioned it, um, and that is sometimes also we've seen that when, you know, headquarters are very diligent about enforcing and implementing uh, and doing human rights impact assessments, data protection impact assessments, when it trickles down to the field level uh, where field office operates, sometimes those rules are not necessarily followed. Uh, it could be because of lack of capacity or lack of resources or the sector in which they're operating or the context in which they're operating, but here it's key also to ensure that those um, tools are being implemented at the lowest level where there is direct interaction uh, with um, affected communities. And, um, and so that's one point to highlight on the enforcement bit. And then last um, uh, key point to raise here is around public-private partnership. I think that's very important to help um, strengthen um, the Human Rights Due Diligence Guide. When private companies are being procured, um, we don't see any information uh, from a number of UN agencies about why they have selected specific countries. There were also examples where uh, companies are, you know, with shady human rights records, are have been partnering with UN, UN agencies. Like Palantir is one classical example that uh, that comes to mind. Um, and when civil society asks for more information or transparency on how s company X has been selected, uh, we don't receive answers. So I think adding an, or um, strengthening transparency on public-private partnership, due diligence for the companies that are procured are just as important as assessing the negative or potential or foreseen uh, negative human rights impacts of the programs or the technologies themselves. Thanks very much, Myra. It's really great to get your fl reflections on it. And your second point uh, related to the transparency in the process and involvement uh, of civil society, which you said was was key to making this process work. And I think your, your comments gave us a good example of that. I mean, we need that sort of um, input about, about where we've gotten and how much further we have to go. Uh, that doesn't mean we'll necessarily get there all in one step. Um, but it's it's very important to, to have that that spotlight and and to understand you know where uh, what what needs to be done and and um, and how how we need to move not just from the guidance and not just from the implementation but to look at some of these key issues about how to make sure that it's as deep and meaningful um, and that these questions around transparency and and independent uh, auditing and other things are, are addressed so thanks for that um, with that, uh, I think it's time for us to move quickly to the question and answer. Um, we, as I said, we're very grateful to those of you that uh, have joined us for this session. Um, we're happy to, we have people online, I think, that uh, may come in with questions as well, but we'd be very happy to prioritize questions in the room first. If, if people want to uh, just, we're a small enough group, I think you can just uh, flag me and I, be happy uh, for, I think you need to go to the mic just so the people online will be able to hear it, I'm being told. Anybody have any questions or comments on what they've heard? Mm, I'm seeing none. Sorry? And there you go. Oh, thank you. And if you can introduce yourself as well, please. Sure. Um, my name is Bosher Ibadi. 
Um, my question is around um, like these guidelines that are being created. Um, I'm wondering how much of a space there is to actually talk about what's influencing, again, the decision-making process around procuring certain technologies within the UN system um, and thinking about, like, I mean, there's funding that goes into the system from certain actors that like have their priorities and agendas that are clearly set out, but that's not necessarily something that could be made transparent, I think, within the parameters of how the UN system currently functions. But for like an internal mechanism within the UN system, that's there's also a lack of clarity within it. So like, is there anything that's being developed maybe to make that more transparent internally, even if it's not something that can be publicly shared? Um, because I think that's an important part of understanding the decision-making process of why certain technologies are being pushed and like the underlying narrative around those technologies. Because there's like the understanding that maybe they'll improve efficiency, for example, with UNHCR's um, use of biometric technology, there was a lot that was um, discussed about it decreasing um, fraud instances, but those were seen to be so negligible that it didn't merit the risks that those populations were being exposed to as a result of the use of those technologies. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any mechanism that's being considered there as well. I'm sorry. Great, thanks. No, it's a, a good a good follow-up question to the, the comments that, that Marwa made as well. I'll just see if there are any others that wanted to come in with questions and then we can go back to the panel and others for response on that point. Anybody else want to come in? Do we have any questions online, Eugene, that we should bring in? Oh, oh sorry, please. Hello, I'm Ana Cristina Ruelas from UNESCO, and I have a question about the independence of assessments. How to identify who is going to do the, in the independent assessment when you have like different bodies? Like what is your experience of who will be the independent uh, body that will perform assessments when it comes to UN agencies which have many uh, member states with different views? Should the member state decide uh, different uh, different names f to perform the assessment? Should civil society decide, which civil society should decide? What would be your recommendation on that? Because it's very like, that That will be like a how to uh, develop that independency. Please, we'll take this one last question then I'll go back to the panel with all three. Hi, my name's Oliver. I can't name my organization because of security. Uh, risks. Um, my question is, um, because UNESCO just start, stood up, would the human rights due diligence um, that you're developing, would it apply to the UNESCO guidelines that are currently also in development? Because a lot of civil society have been asking why the UNESCO guidelines have no uh, due diligence process. Thanks. Well, so we have three questions on the table. Um, I think, Nick, if you're there, maybe it makes sense to go to you first as, as UNHCR has, has been coming to the conversation at, at several occasions. But I, I think, you know, to potentially broaden it out um, and just have a sense from you about, you know, how you're dealing with some of the challenges that have been raised around public-private partnerships and transparency around them um, and, the, you know, the different uh, factors that are in play when, when UNHCR is looking at some of these uh, issues including the, the use of independent assessments and other things. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy. I, I think that, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a good question, the question about the purposes um, for which uh, certain technologies are chosen. And I think one good reference point that um, civil society and other stakeholders now have is UNHCR's digital transformation a strategy, which I'm just going to drop the link into the chat so that you can see there what uh, our objectives are on digital. And you can you can see in that strategy that it's very much focused on uh, the people that we serve. Three goals of the five are, you know, digital protection, digital inclusion, and providing more digital services for the people we serve. And so there, I think that there's uh, more of a clear idea on the, the business side, if you like, of what we want to use digital technology for. And it's the first strategy that we've had. So I think it's an important uh, reference point. On um, uh, transparency questions, I think that one of the key opportunities, but also I think fundamental challenges that we've identified in the work we've, we've done around the human rights due diligence guidance is how can we 
effectively engage with uh, civil society stakeholders uh, in uh, the implementation of that guidance. Um, I think that you know, from talking to experts in the private sector, that's also a challenge that businesses have faced. And I would very much welcome an opportunity to discuss with Access Now and other stakeholders ideas on how we can make that work. On the one hand, uh, you know, uh, respecting that there may be some uh, confidentiality questions that arise, but also how important it will be um, to include uh, civil society in those due diligence um, processes. Um, on the question of uh, independent assessments, I think that that's a particular challenge within the UN system. There is an independent auditing function that, um, that does look at the work of UN agencies. And once the policy that Scott refers to uh, is adopted, that policy will become auditable, if you like. Um, but uh, and on the other hand, we have, say, in the context of data protection, established uh, uh, agreements with expert suppliers to help uh, bring both expertise, but also uh, some independent rigor to data protection impact assessments that, that have been undertaken both at the global and the field level. Um, but uh, I think the jury's still out from UNHCR's perspective about whether uh, independent entities undertaking uh, audits of the implementation of the the guidance beyond the existing system um, would be uh, would be something that we could work well with. Um, but overall, I think that uh, we're on a learning process, as I said in my earlier comments, and would very much welcome greater dialogue and discussions with civil society about how um, how we can best make this guidance work. Back to you. Great, thanks very much, Nick. Um, and I'll turn to, to David to see if you have any comments on that and then to the panelists here. Yeah, sure, thank you. And, and just wanted to follow up very quickly on, on Marwa's comment and the, the, the ensuing discussion on enforcement and, and related issues. Um, <clears throat> I agree. I, I think that that le lends itself towards accountability, which is definitely, um, required and that while we don't have anything specific on human rights at the moment we, we do have a variety of, of other tools that are available both to our borrowers and to civil society and the beneficiaries of our of our, our work and, and some of those in, are the following one of them is um, <clears throat> our we have a grievance redress mechanism in our projects and so every project will will have this so that if there is uh, a negative impact on someone, an individual, for example, they can then appeal to the World Bank to um, seek redress for whatever harm they've encountered. We also have, in terms of the, and I think this might address in part the PPP question or working with the private sector, a lot of the financing that we provide to governments goes to vendors or consultants um, or contractors. So, um, you know, if, if it's a roads project, we're not going to build the road. The government's not going to build the road. They're going to hire someone to, to build the road. But in that context, um, we have our fraud and corruption guidelines, which, uh, to borrow the phrase, sort of follows the money and all the way down the chain to the, the most local uh, subcontractors. So to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing with the money. We also have in, a, in the broadest sense, the organization called the Inspection Panel, which is independent and which um, can be in, uh, invoked if there are, are you know, issues that arise in one of our projects that uh, there was some serious breach or, or something like that. And we also have internally a group called the Independent Evaluation Department, which um, retrospectively looks at projects and terms of lessons learned and what, what worked, what didn't work. And so collectively, there's a lot of accountability mechanisms that are there. They're, they're not specifically designed right now necessarily to address human rights, but there's no reason that they couldn't be adapted to include human rights issues. And as Nick said, you know, over the past few years since the you know, entry into force of GDPR, personal data protection is, is a huge issue for us. Um, 
we provided billions of dollars of financing in the COVID pandemic. And maybe some of you remember that from a couple of years ago. But the, you know, the, the amount of personal data that was being collected by our recipients at that time, we realized was going to be huge. Um, and we wanted to put in place mechanisms in our lending uh, instruments that would, uh, would ensure that our borrowers had in place the right kind of uh, legal and technical measures to protect personal data. Some, some of our borrowers had laws in place and we could rely on those. In other cases, there weren't legal frameworks in place. And so we worked with our borrowers to make sure that for those projects, uh, the, 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 the projects themselves had uh, a framework in place. Now, let me just digress for a moment there. Our, our members are sovereigns. The World Bank is a sovereign. When, it, when, when we have a lending instrument, when we do a financing agreement, a sovereign to sovereign agreement is a treaty. It's a very powerful instrument. And when we did those COVID projects with countries that didn't necessarily have a data protection regime in place, we built it into our agreement. And so we were pretty comfortable with the fact that that sovereign to sovereign agreement, that treaty for the purpose of the data that was collected uh, in that context of COVID was gonna be protected. So not perfect, but certainly we, you know, a tool that we had that we used to make sure that to the extent that we could, those issues were being addressed, over. Great, thank you, thank you very much, David. It's great to get that insight. Um, we only have a couple minutes left. We're starting to hear noises outside of our room here in, in Kyoto. Um, Marwa, I'll turn to you quickly. I don't wanna hold people. Um, quickly, I couldn't agree more with the first comment, and that's an issue we also face. Often um, technologies are deployed or used uh, without evidence. And I think it's evidence-based solutions are very important in a context where, again, private companies are happy to sell you, um, and I use this term, snake oil, or you know, solutions that could have serious ramifications or negative impact on human rights. Um, and, th and therefore, for us as civil society organizations, we sometimes struggle to understand the rationale why certain solutions that are disproportionate, given their human rights uh, impacts, are being used and justified. So having an evidence to say, for instance, with biometric registration that there is no other solution but biometric registration that justify the collection and processing of sensitive data and therefore, and based on this evidence and this research. Uh, research, of course, is in resource intensive, time intensive, and, and I understand again that in challenging contexts, that's hard to achieve all the time, but nevertheless, it is important uh, to, to scrutinize the narratives behind certain technologies such as AI. Um, the point on uh, independent assessments, I mean, I'm not in the business of promoting uh, certain entities, uh, but there are, of course, uh, companies or civil society organizations that are specialized in doing exactly that, uh, doing human rights due diligence. And as someone who had participated in a number of consultations, my job as a civil society organization to ensure that those um, you know, as auditors or, you know, companies are speaking to the right people. So they're not just speaking to Access Now as a global organization, but that can actually speak to grassroots organizations, so the people who belong to the communities that might be affected. Um, that's, I think, something that civil society should continue doing um, in building bridges, and I understand um, the difficulty in uh, reaching out to the stakeholders, which I believe Nick had uh, mentioned. Um, and that's something that civil society can can help with. Uh, an organization like Access Now, we have partners across the world, and we're more than happy to connect um, whenever consultation needed. And the same, of course, applies to other partners. Great, thanks, Marwa. Uh, Quentin, uh, a closing word from Quentin. Yep, sure. Thanks very much. And. Um, just bringing it back to the overall uh, role of this non-binding guidance, and uh, it kind of helps to reconcile these two challenges. One is how we have uh, horizontal alignment across the different UN agencies and entities, and then making it principles-based such that it can be translated into those local contexts. Um, it's not a surefire uh, outcome guaranteeing kind of thing. To get to that, probably uh, to hard code it into the operational procedures like procurement, uh, one would need to have it baked into the entity-specific procedures, including the tendering process, um, you know, the kind of 
checklists and auditing that goes on those procurement processes. Uh, and that can, this guidance can be, you know, a beacon for each entity to do that kind of hard coding. It has to be done entity by entity because each entity has its own governing bodies. For example, in the Secretariat, the General Assembly prescribes housekeeping rules, we call it, but um, basically the way in which the UN does its procurement and has the criteria for procurement handed down by the GA, whereas UNHCR, other agencies will have more flexibility in some cases. But it can act as this kind of beacon, this guidance, for each entity to hard code these kinds of principles into its own local procedures. And also just um, in closing, as a, as a kind of beacon just for individual people, staff members who are working in the organizations, um, I recall, for example, during the COVID days, uh, when the Secretariat itself was considering how to deal with uh, the pandemic and whether to introduce its own contact tracing, proximity uh, tracking system. And in the end, it was a judgment. It was an emergency and it was a judgment. And in my opinion, the correct judgment went, you know, won out, which was that we were not going to do it and that the partner who was offering to do it was not going to be able to meet the uh, privacy and uh, you know kind of requirements that were uh, appropriate for the cons for the case, but it was a judgment call. And this kind of human rights due diligence framework offers this kind of um, load star for the system to both translate uh, the principles into its own kind of regular procedures, but also for individuals who are taking judgment calls on a day-to-day -day basis. Great, thanks very much, Quinton. We've run over time, so just to conclude by saying that that you know we've we've had a, a good conversation here. Some some uh, important questions have been raised around transparency and assessments and enforcement. Those are issues that we will you know look very seriously at, and the interagency working group uh, will take them on board as we're looking to to implement and move forward uh, in this process. And uh, I think it's. Uh, coming at it from a previously civil society perspective, I have to say, I think, you know, from my interaction with the, with the, the UN agencies involved, there's a real commitment to trying to move this forward in a positive way. Um, but some of the issues raised are difficult ones for us for us to solve. The, the issues of the public-private partnerships and the, the corporate engagement. Um, I'm, I'm in charge of digital transformation uh, from a champion standpoint at my organization and one of the things in reaching out to other UN agencies to, to have a sense of how they've been able to do what they wanted to do within digital transformation is you know, the real recognition that the funding is not there uh, for it to happen except in the context of, of some of these important partnerships and, and you know, we're grateful for that because the UN has to be an ent entity that, that functions with all of the tools necessary to protect human rights in my regard, to protect refugees in UNHCR's regard. So, um, so these are challenging things for us to implement, but we, we really appreciate the input and uh, commit to continuing the conversation as, as we go forward. Thank you all for staying so late uh, and missing the, the reception outdoors. Uh, I hope you'll, you'll get a chance uh, to enjoy the evening here in Kyoto, and thanks again for all your time. And thanks to our panelists for all their efforts.